Amen. Well, listen, let's open our Bibles. Let's not talk about the weather. And let's open them to Ephesians chapter 6, if you can find that opening in your Bible. And if you would like, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to use these two openings for our text this evening, as most of you know that have been with us uh, for our midweek services on Wednesday night, the ones I've had the privilege, at least, to communicate with you about. We've been talking about the believer's authority and uh, I've said many times, and it is true, it's, it's nearly inexhaustible. But thank God for the part we do know. And as we make an application of those things within our lives, uh, it really can be life-altering. I'm so glad to have the knowledge of the truth. Aren't you tonight? Praise God. So we're going to learn some things, and we're going to get into it, and it's going to be good. So let's go ahead and bow our heads together, and uh, we'll pray, and away we'll go. Father, we uh, come together in the matchless name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. And Father God, again, I'm so thankful for what it is you've done for us and that which you have provided. Thank you, Lord God, for the revelation knowledge of your word, the entrance of it that gives life, understanding, and light to each and every one of us. So, Father, as we break the bread of life tonight, we thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit. He's the one whom you've sent to lead, guide, and teach us. And Father God, we call upon him this evening to do just that, to bring to our remembrance those things that you've spoken to us. And Father God, I thank you for illuminating, enlightening our path, our minds, our hearts, our understanding concerning your will for each and every one of us. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. Praise God. Notice with me here in Ephesians chapter 6. The Apostle Paul, in this letter that he wrote, there's a, actually, I've said this before, but it would be good for you if you just took the time to uh, read the whole letter, the book of Ephesians, because in it, there's, there's, it's just packed full of stuff uh, with regard to the revelation of God and His plan and will for our lives, particularly in the first and second chapters. And then also here we find this um, opening where Paul is kind of making, as it were, his final comments, but nevertheless uh, hugely important. Notice with me in verse 10 of the sixth chapter of Ephesians, Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Everybody say, be strong in the Lord. Strong in the Lord. Not in yourself. He said, be strong in the Lord and in the power of of his might or his ability. Hallelujah. And then he said, uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against, the King James used the word wiles, or some of your translations say, may say schemes, of the devil. For or because, in verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high or in heavenly places. So we see in this scripture that Paul is saying, you need to be strong in the Lord and you need to put on the whole armor of God for the purpose that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil or the devil's schemes. And we've all all come to understand in our study that fundamentally Jesus went to the cross, bled and died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. The Bible says that he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly and triumphed over them in it. Hallelujah. Now we know also that what he did, he did for us, not for himself. He was already the son of God. So the price that he paid, the the stripes that he bore, and all of the things that are associated with uh, his suffering was for us. And we know from the scriptures that Jesus said that all authority or power is given unto me both in heaven and in earth. He said, I have the keys of, of death, hell, and the grave. I am alive forevermore. Hallelujah. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Hallelujah. But he conferred this authority in this place to the church. You and I are members within the body of Christ or the church. And he wants us to learn to not only know these truths, but to exercise them where our lives are concerned. So we come back to this fundamental thing that Paul was talking about here is that you and I are to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, not in our own strength, but in his. And then it said again, 
put on the whole armor of God, the reason being so that you can stand against the wiles or the devil's schemes. Now, again, let me just, I'm reiterating this because we need to get our head wrapped around the, the, the facts or the truth that we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but we do wrestle against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high and heavenly places. Angela intimated a bit about that in her exhortation before we sang tonight about, you know, you, there's many times when we can be discouraged, we can be uh, 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 depressed, we can be, uh, you know, wanting to quit, give up. Well, that, none of that comes from heaven. I said heaven doesn't have any of that. So it has to come from another source. You know, if, if you are having these thoughts or a conversation in your mind that you're no good, uh, that you'll never make it, or you're not you know, smart, or you're dumb, or whatever. The, again, none of these things. You'll never, ever hear any of that come from heaven where your life is concerned. But it comes. And we have to deal with it, you know, because of what we don't understand, and that is that we are the workmanship of God in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Which he has before ordained the good works that you and I are to perform. He's before ordained that we should walk in them, not in that other stuff. So you have to deal with these things. You know, part of it, you know, is just renewing your mind to the word. The Bible tells us that... Um, he said, uh, God promised, he said, I will keep in perfect peace the guy or gal whose mind is stayed on thee because we trust in him. Hallelujah. So we just have to, you got to fight fire with fire, man. I mean, you know, you got to know what, you, what you're doing. And thank God that's the reason why we have these, you know, services on Wednesday night so we can, you know, uh, get into the meat and potatoes of things and really learn how to deal with uh, the things that we're, we're, we're challenged with. Hallelujah. And thank God for that. But, you know, it takes faith, and thank God you've got it. Now, let's look at this verse, too, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Notice with me in verse 3, again, the Apostle Paul is saying, For though we walk in the flesh, how many of you are alive tonight? Okay, good. That's a, that's a good thing. All right? So, even though we walk in the flesh, now listen, we do not what? War after the flesh. He goes on then to explain, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty. Hallelujah. Through God. Doesn't that sound like be strong in the Lord and the power of his might? Yeah. But they are, these weapons of ours are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Casting down, the King James uses the word uh, imaginations, some of your Bible translations may say reasonings. Is that what it says here? Uh, they're using the King James, so it probably wouldn't be the case. But anyway, casting down imaginations or reasonings which exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Condemnation is such a hideous and yet effective scheme of the devil where people's lives are concerned. Condemnation. You're not this. You're not that. You're too smart or you're too short. You're too tall. You're too fat. You're too whatever. I mean, it doesn't make any difference. He will use anything to try to defeat you and keep you from having the joy of the Lord that is your strength. Are you listening to me? So it's important for us to understand. Now, how many of you believe that the Bible is God speaking to us? Yes. How many of you believe that it's true? Yes. So when we read these scriptures here, it says, even though you're walking in the flesh, your battle is not with the flesh. Huh? But rather, he goes on to say that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to pull down strongholds, cast down imaginations and every high thing which exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now notice, it goes on then to say, and bringing into captivity, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Any of you had your mind run wild? <laughs> All of us have. 
you know. But we have to recognize what it is that's going on within our lives. And thank God we are not alone. Thank God we are not without help. Thank God we have weapons that we can use to put the devil on the run. Hallelujah. The Bible says resist the devil and he will what? Flee, Flee from you. Hallelujah. So we just need to know the functionality and the operation of these things, how to exercise these rights and privileges that are ours because of Christ Jesus. Now, the other dynamic and the element that we talked about is, is that, you know, obviously you can't be living in sin and have any confidence toward God. Huh? So if you get in the devil's territory, then he's got a right to beat you bloody. So you got to get out of that, get into the mercy of God and the grace of God and be able to stand your ground, praise God, and enjoy heaven's best. So, you know, uh, <clears throat> we want to talk about this, but we're going to look, look, we're going to look at it from the practical side, or you could call it the vital side. There's the legal side. There's that which Jesus has done. And then there's the part where it's a reality in your life. Are you with me? Because these things are, this, th this is true. You know, he's done what was necessary so that you would not ever have to live under the authority of darkness again. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. So we, we really do have to learn these things and understand this. And, and again, the practical application of this authority and how that it works. So in the scriptures that we read, the two uh, scriptures that we took as our text, the Apostle Paul makes it abundantly clear that we are in, we're engaged in a warfare, a spiritual warfare. You know, the devil hates the church. He doesn't want to see spirit-filled churches. He doesn't want to see life-giving churches. He doesn't want to see people giving their heart to Christ. He doesn't want to see them coming back to God. He doesn't want to see them healed. He doesn't want to see them restored. He doesn't want to see their needs being met. He, doesn't want to, he wants to destroy everything and anything that represents, you know, God and his most prized creation. That's you. So thank God when Jesus came, he delivered us so that we would be able, praise God, to stand against these wiles of the devil and come out victorious. And so Jesus came, he dealt with the spiritual needs of man. He stripped Satan of all of his authority over mankind. So the need is for man to know and understand what's been done and listen and learn to walk in the light of it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, you know, if the devil comes in some form, fashion, or another, we can say, oh, no, you don't, devil. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You're a liar, and you have no place in this house. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? So, again, we'll look at this, the legal side of this and what, what, what Christ, we actually, we talk about that a lot. But we want to talk about the vital side. So here's a couple more scriptures for us to look at. Turn back in Ephesians there, chapter 1. We've looked at these before, but again, I want, you to, I want you to think about, you need to really take these scriptures, write them down, and, and take some time and meditate on what it is that's being said. Notice with me again in Paul's prayer here, let's start with uh, verse 19. It says, and what is his prayer was so that you would see, know and understand, have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. And in, the, and in this prayer, he says, to see what is the exceeding greatness of his power to or toward us who believe. And then he says, according to the working of his mighty power. Now notice this, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And now notice, and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. And then it says, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion. So Jesus has authority, isn't that right? But now notice in the second chapter, dropping down to verse 6, it says this, it says, and has raised us up together. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So if you and I are seated together with him in heavenly places, which the scriptures tell us we are, then it can mean no less that you and I share the authority that that place represents. Hallelujah. Far above 
all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named. Everybody say hallelujah. Yeah, thank God for that. Glory to God. So the legal aspect of our deliverance has been cared for by the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And so the need, again, is for the Christian to know and to exercise this authority in a vital or practical kind of way. Now let's look at another verse of Scripture in Colossians chapter 1. If you want to turn over there with me, just right close by there. We've used this scripture again, uh, or before, but it bears repetition. Colossians chapter 1, verse 12. Giving thanks. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Thank God for the liberty. Thank God for the freedom. Thank God for the authority that belongs to us in Christ. Giving thanks unto the Father, which has made us meet, or able, or we could say qualified us. Yes, qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who has delivered us. Everybody say hallelujah. Yeah, he's delivered us. Everybody say, I am delivered. Glory to God, you're not going to be, you are. Huh? Who has delivered us from the power or authority of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood and the forgiveness of our sins. Praise God. Now, here's the thing you have to understand. You've been given the legal right to stand against the wiles of the devil because of what it is that Jesus did for you and be victorious, to live in victory. You have the legal right to do that. Christ provided it for you on the cross at Calvary. You know, it's, it's kind of like... Um, if I could use an analogy, you know, uh, my wife and I, we have a rental property or we have some properties and, and um, we own them. We have the title deed to them. They're all ours. And we've made arrangements with individuals, you know, to be able to rent those properties. And, you know, they sign a lease and all of the things. And we have rules about how this, that and the other is supposed to function and so on and so forth. And, and they are permitted to live there. All right but they still belong to us. We have the deed to them. So, you know, the thing that you have to understand is, is that, you know, it'd be really strange if we, the owners, were to say, well, you know, I wonder if I could go up there to that property and, you know, kind of look around and make sure that everything's the way it's supposed to be and, you know, and this and that and the other. And, uh, you know, because after all, there are other people living there. Well, that'd be kind of dumb, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be a bit silly to think that way? No, we own them. Matter of fact, we can give notice to them and say, hey, we want to come in. We want to take a look. We want to make sure that everything's scope steady and you're taking care of the place and not, you know, burning it down, you know, or whatever the case might be. Why? Because we have the right. It belongs to us. It's just like you. If you have a piece of property, you know, and you have your home on it, and let's say it's three, four acres or something like that, and somebody comes and, you know, knocks on your door and says, hey, we decided we're going to pull our trailer in over here. We got a little camper. We're just going to live right here next to you. You would say, well, who are you? And so, well, that doesn't make any difference. We just decided, it, you know, we kind of like the view you got here, and so we're just going to make this our home. Well, immediately you would say, uh, wait a minute, uh, I don't think so. Why? Because it's not theirs. And you have to understand that the devil is a rebel holder of authority. And if you let him come in and, and, and squat on the land of your life, he will flat do it. So you have to take your place and you have to say, that's not going to happen. So you might as well just go right on down the road because you are not welcome here. Are you listening to me? And you say, well, what in, in what forms would that be? Well, it could be when he comes along and he wants to get you in strife and you say, no, nothing doing. It could be when he comes along and wants to get you into unforgiveness and you say, no, nope, that's not going to happen. Or he comes along, you know, and, and uh, <clears throat> he wants to uh, uh, do something along the lines of jealousy or bitterness or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. You know, if he wants to come toting his junk, you know, sickness and disease, and you just say, nope, not here. I'm redeemed. I'm forgiven. His blood has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. Isn't that good? Yes. It's wonderful. 
And that belongs to us, but again, it has to be exercised. And again, a lot of people, they're not even aware that they have any authority. Stuff comes at them and they don't know what to do with it. And they're saying, well, you know, Lord, help. And, and God is saying, I've already helped. Take your place. Stand your ground. Do what is necessary. Because the thing is, Satan does not have a legal right to anything where your life is concerned. But he does have the right to try. And the reason is, we're both occupying this piece of dirt until Jesus comes. So he can be here, and we are here, and he can try, but thank God we don't have to let him. Can you say amen? So it's important for us to understand that. And, and there's no better, I mean, uh, again, Angela referred to it, is uh, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. He was led by the Spirit out into the wilderness for 40 days, and then it says, being tempted of the devil. It seems to imply that a lot of the temptation didn't come until the very end. Because the first thing was because he hungered. And again, she has a significant point. Because the thing that came to him in the way of temptation was to doubt who he was. And the same thing's true for the child of God. If you start doubting who you are, the Bible says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doesn't appear what we shall be, but we know, praise God, when he shows up, then it's going to be awesome. But right now, we're the children of God. I'm a child of God. You're a child of God. We sing about it. And praise God, we are, in fact, born of the Spirit of God. We're his children. So we have this place. We've been adopted into the family of God. There's such a beautiful, wonderful place that God has provided for us in Christ Jesus. And the devil has no place if we don't give it to him. But he can try, just like he did Jesus. He tried on, in three different areas with regard to his physical being and being hungry, and not only that, but to tempt him with giving him authority or power of all the worlds. Are you listening to me? And then the other thing, you know, when he took him up on the uh, pinnacle and said, why don't you jump off, you know? But Jesus responded with the word. He responded with what the Bible has to say. Well, that's a good clue for you and me, amen? Amen. 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 And so it's important for us to learn these things and understand these. The Bible says that when the devil had ended all of his temptations, he departed from him for a season. Well, the Bible says also, as we go on, that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit and started kicking butt and taking names. Are you listening to me? So I will guarantee you that Satan said, I got a problem, but I don't know what to do with it. Because he didn't bite. I said he didn't bite. Huh? And so he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. Listen, God's with you, child of God. He's for you. He's in you. And if God be for you, who and what can be against you? Are you listening to me? So it's important for us to understand these truths and, again, to exercise ourselves in them. You remember when Jesus was there in the garden with the disciples, he was talking about the end, the plan, and what it is that God was going to do. And, you know, he said, I know that sorrow has filled your heart, but I'm telling you what, there's coming a joy here and not too long that nobody will be able to take away from you. Hallelujah. Well, in the context of that, the Bible says, he said, I'm not going to talk with you much anymore. He said, for the prince of this world comes. Now, think about that with me. What did he mean by that? Him, he meant Satan is on his way. But we didn't have a physical manifestation of Satan in the garden. But we had Roman soldiers. And we had all of the individuals that, you know, he basically yielded himself to. You know? The only reason he did it is is because of the will of God in his life to serve as a sacrifice for all of us. He said, if the cup's possible to pass, Father, remove it from me, but not my will, your will be done. And he really won the victory of that whole deal in, in a prayer closet. Are you with me? Because of what, well, that's not our subject, but anyway. 
But the Bible, again, he said, he, the prince of this world comes and he has nothing in me. Well, the prince of this world was manifested again in all those Roman soldiers, in Herod, in Pilate, you know, and all of his cohorts that were standing around. The religious people crucified him. Huh? So before you get too lovey-dovey with the, with the religious world, you might want to think that over a little bit. Religion will take you to hell. Huh? Because it, it tries to circumvent. Religion in so many ways, there is a true religion. Don't, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying. But man's religion intends to circumvent God's requirement. And that is to bow your knee to the Lord Jesus Christ and declare that he is Lord. Hallelujah. And repent. Amen. That's, again, another subject. So, when you walk in the light of God's Word and in obedience to the laws of God's jurisdiction, there's nothing the devil can do to harm you. That's why you don't stick your foot in a trap. Huh? You know, so many times, because, you know, sometimes we're clueless, you know, and you make mistakes. Any of you ever made any mistakes? You ever went someplace you shouldn't have went, said something you shouldn't have said, did something you shouldn't have done? We all have. Thank God for forgiveness and for repentance. So it's, it's true that there's nothing he can do to harm you, but it's also true that if you walk in darkness, if you yield yourself to some of the things we've already talked about, well, then you open yourself up to problems. I use this verse of Scripture here in Romans chapter 6 and 16. We'll look at it again. It says, um, almost got him. All right. You don't see it, but I got this fly that's bugging me. Okay. <laughs> he knows the cold's coming and he, his days, well, hours are numbered. So anyway, sorry about that interruption. Romans 6 and 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants uh, you are to whom you obey, whether it is sin of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Now, this is an interesting comment because the Apostle Paul says, don't you know? Well, obviously, some people don't. That to whoever you yield yourself to, to obey, they become your servants. Okay? And then he makes the distinction of sin unto death or, again, obedience unto righteousness. Huh? I know, honey. Just keep... He is a little distracting, you know. <laughs> the Lord of the flies. Hallelujah. Amen. So let's, let's take a look at this verse of Scripture together. You're there in Ephesians. Look at the fourth chapter of Ephesians. Oh, no, you're in Colossians. But look at the fourth chapter of Ephesians. You're going to die, buddy. Yeah, okay. Ephesians chapter 4. Hallelujah. I don't know if there's anything prophetic about that, but anyway. Uh, notice this verse of Scripture here. Um, verse 27. Ephesians chapter um, 4, verse 27. Neither give place... Notice, don't give place to the devil. Obviously, there must be a way that that happens. Would you not agree? So, so if you back up, it tells us that, you know, if you have an opportunity to be angry, don't you sin. Huh? It says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, you get that straightened up. Huh? Huh? Um. There's uh, the New Living Translation says it this way. It says, and don't sin by letting anger gain control of you. 
Why? Because when people get angry, they do things and they say things and they whatever and they end up where they don't belong. Huh? And then right on the heels of that, he says, and neither give place to the devil. Hallelujah. So there's an application there with regard to anger that we just need to make sure we place ourselves, uh, uh, pl- place our heart on God, uh, on make sure our heart is being guarded. Sorry, you know. Now here's another thing. We talked about this and we'll just touch on it briefly. And that has to do with your attitude. The devil will do whatever he can to make you have a sour, bad attitude. Because people that have bad attitudes typically start making mistakes, again, saying things they shouldn't say, doing things they shouldn't do, so on and so forth. And not only that, it just gives you a bad day, okay? So, you know, your attitude determines your altitude. And we want to fly above whatever it is that hell is trying to bring our way. Can you say amen? Amen. And and it it becomes imperative where the child of God is concerned not to allow you, don't allow yourself to corkscrew yourself into the ground with a bad attitude. Are you with me? And uh, you can do that. Now, um, it it is so important. I, I think about it like this. Think about Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are out on this missionary journey. They're, all they're doing is try, endeavoring to obey God, right? And they're praying, they're asking God for direction, and they're thinking maybe that they need to go to Bithynia or some, other, some of these other countries, but the Bible says they were forbidden by the Holy Ghost. Well, in the night, uh, Paul had a, a dream or a vision, and he said that there was a man that stood before him from Macedonia that said, come down and help us. So he, the Bible says, assuredly gathered that the Lord was leading them through that to go to um, Philippi, Macedonia. And so they went down there and uh, they end up in jail. And not only did they end up in jail, but they got beat. And I mean, all kinds of things. I mean, everything went sideways because, uh, because of, uh, well, a lot of things. The, the, the gospel started being preached and the devil didn't like it. Now, I use that example to show you or or to let it serve as an example, I guess I should say, that, you know, if Paul and Silas wanted to, they could have got a really stinky attitude. Here we are trying to obey you, Lord, and this is what happens. Now, that's not that far removed from a lot of folk who make decisions to become followers of Jesus, and when they do, all hell breaks loose. And then all of a sudden, people are saying, well, God, what are you doing here? You know, I'm trying to obey you. I'm trying to do it. And he said, good. Keep it right up. Hallelujah. Be an example. Praise God. Be the person that God wants, uh, that I want you to be. And obey me. Praise God. And I'll see you through. Hallelujah. But we don't do that. We think somehow or another God has forsaken us, abandoned us. Uh, You know, it's not fair. The devil has a whole myriad of of comments and statements and thinking. Remember it said casting down reasonings or imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. If God really loved you, he'd be doing something. If God really loved you, he wouldn't let this blah, blah, blah. If God really this or whatever the case, he's got a long list of stuff. Whatever he thinks will work on you, that's what he'll tell you. But the fact of the matter is, is that God is on our side and that God had nothing to do with it. And so he masks what it is that he did and then tries to blame it on God in your way of thinking so that you'll lose heart, faint, and give up. But you know, the apostle Paul and Silas, man, dude, they're in the bowels of this prison You know, down in some cave, God only knows where. We have no idea what the conditions might have been like, but I can tell you they weren't good. And so what do they do? The Bible says that they prayed and sang praises to God. And all the rest of the prisoners heard them. I guarantee you those prisoners said, them guys are nuts. But there was something angelic. There was something anointed. There was something holy about what it is that they were doing as they exalted and lifted up the name of Jesus and praised his wonderful name. And all of a sudden, heaven showed up in that deal. And the Bible says that God shook that place. 
And not only that, but every man's bands were loosed and they all got set free. Now that, my friend, is a testimony. But I got to believe that a big part of that was is that Paul and Silas didn't buy into the lie that God is the one who's caused this. We hear it all the time. And it sounds plausible, but the devil is a master at making things seem certain ways. Are you listening to me? And that's why you, child of God, praise God, don't you ever buy into that. You know, Paul, I think we ought to take time to go over here and look at this real quick. Turn over to first, uh, well, wait a minute, I've got to find it. First Corinthians chapter 10, I believe it is. Yeah. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. God doesn't want us ignorant. Can you say amen? He says, I would that you would not be ignorant that all of our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea. It's talking about a, a, a baptism uh, on Moses. And they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And they did all eat the same spiritual meat. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Now notice, but with many of them, God was not well pleased, listen, because they ended up being overthrown in the wilderness. To be overthrown means to be scattered and laid low. And that was not the will of God for one of them. And yet an entire generation died in that wilderness. And he goes down and there's a laundry list of things that, uh, that displease God. And you'll notice if we look for the sake of time in verse 10, neither murmur, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of serpents. Now all these things happened to them for in samples or types or examples, I guess you should say, and they're written for our, uh, uh, written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Man, dude, we're right in the middle of this thing and this has been written for you and me right here, right now, tonight, so that we don't make the same mistake in wanting to blame God for whatever problems that are going on in our lives. Because he's not the problem, he's the answer. I said he's the answer. So we just gotta, you, you know, you gotta get it straight in your brain. I mean, you think about preachers, their preachers are standing in pulpits and saying that there is no literal devil. Dude, they need to be, sent somewhere else and leaving those people uh, so uninformed. But again, in this particular situation, I, I, we're talking about it in the context of attitude. Don't let him get to you in that way. You say, well, what's the answer? Why don't we just do like Paul and Silas? Let's pray and sing praises unto God. Amen? When we, when we have this sense or we have this feeling that this stuff is coming on us, then the best thing, praise God, to do is, I mean, plug in something, do whatever it is you got to do, make a joyful noise. Hallelujah. Tell the devil to take a hike. Now, there's other things that we talked about last week, but I want to get down to, uh, for the sake of time, because we're running out of it. You know, I, I talked about the ignorance of, of, of the word. You cannot be ignorant. I would not have you ignorant. Don't be ignorant. So that's why, thank God, we can be here tonight. We can look into these things. And maybe if, if I mean, maybe you know these things, but at least it'll help to solidify them. It never hurts to hear it again, you know. And so um, um, Hosea 4 and 6 says, my people end up um, being destroyed for their lack of knowledge. And Paul, the apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians 2 and 11, he said, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Well, if you are ignorant, he does have an advantage. Huh? But thank God tonight we're learning some stuff. You know, um, um, <clears throat> I'll give you this example. You know, hell is always trying to get people, Christians particularly, to compromise. Don't compromise. When you have absolutes in your life about what it is that you do and don't do, don't ever let go of them. 
Because, you know, people come around, well, now, come on. You know, you don't have to be so stiff about this. You don't have to this. You don't have to that. Dude, I'm not playing a devil's game. And I'm not compromising where the word of God is concerned. And yet you'll hear it all the time. You know, and people, you know, well, they're just better than... I remember when we got saved and we made a decision to become followers of Christ. You know, they, they, they chided and, and mocked us and, and really almost to scorn about, the, well, they got religion. We didn't get religion, dude. We got a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church. And we got ostracized. They didn't want to have anything to do. And even to this day, and some of them, they don't, I mean, they'll just, they'll, they'll turn and walk the other way. But I tell you what, praise God, heaven is our reward. And it's at the threshold. And it's worth every bit of whatever of that junk that we have to deal with. Are you listening to me? So it's important for us to understand, again, that we're not ignorant of his devices, and one of them is to compromise. I see it all the time. We've seen it. People, they, they cave, you know, and they ended up partying, you know, and end up, you know, at keggers and everything else where we used to go. But I'm telling you what, the Bible tells us that we are to come out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And again, uh, you know, a lot of people, that doesn't make any sense. But I'll tell you this much about it, you guys. There's power in purity. There's huge power in purity. And that's why it's important for us to hang on to it. You know, in culture, and, and this is the thing you're seeing right now, and, it, and it, it makes every attempt it can to creep into the church. And so what it wants you to do is lower the standard, you know, in other words, let's just kind of dumb everything down here so we can all kind of get along or whatever. Dude, it ain't going to happen. The devil will destroy you. And so we have culture, we have religion, we have carnal thinking. We got all these things that endeavor to creep into the church. Are you with me? And, and they come with people. I don't know if you knew that or not. So we hold the standard up here. You know, I found a new way of living, a new life divine. Love, joy, health, peace. Jesus made them mine. Are you listening to me? I remember one time we had, somebody had brought somebody along and, and uh, <clears throat> come to find out the real reason that they wanted to come. Now, I know this sounds strange, man, but the reason that they wanted to come is because there were so many good-looking women in our church. Yeah, and guess what? They're all taken, Bubba. Because all that was is a bunch of lust is all that was. And so this knothead, he comes in here, you know, he's not coming to find God. He's coming to think about, well, what's the possibility? And, they, and so people bring this mess with them and we have to get them into a place where the conviction of God can come on them so that they can find a place of repentance and walk away from all of that and turn their heart and their life over to Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Every so often we run people off. You know, if we, got, if we find out that there's somebody here and they're attending church for those kinds of purposes or whatever, we, we just tell them, you need to find someplace else to go. You're not welcome. Huh? I mean, we don't say that, but on the other hand, that's really what we're saying. Why? Because we have a responsibility to the sheepfold, to the people within it. And I'm not letting some wolf in here, you know. Now, I've only had to do it twice, but thank God, you know, I'm glad. Are you listening to me? I'm not letting the devil in the house. Are you with me? Because a lot of times that's exactly what it is. I thank God for the church. I'm so grateful for this place of refuge, this oasis where we can come and honor the Lord and magnify his name and lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting and to give honor and glory to him. Can you say amen? But there is an attempt that, you know, really the whole deal is to subvert virtue and purity where the lives of people are concerned in the church and, 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 and what it does, it makes the church powerless. And we're not going to let that happen. I said, we're not going to let that happen. 
We're going to make sure that this place is a safe place for our kids, for our teenagers, and for everybody else. I mean, we've had to deal with that before. Because the alternate, you know, ulterior motives of some people, they're not pure. Are you with me? And so you just got to deal with it um, and, and praise God. Uh, when you do, you get blessed. How many of you are still glad you came? I got one more thing I want to share with you for just a few minutes. Will you give me a few more minutes? Okay, look. Look at James chapter 4. This is, we're talking about how to exercise this authority that we've been given. Hallelujah. How to exercise. I, I, it's as simple as, you know, parenting. Um, you know, we went through uh, that whole process with our kids, and maybe they'd have some friends over, and maybe, uh, maybe their friends had some serious potty mouth. Okay? All right. So what do we do? Do we just ignore it? Do we just turn and look the other way? No. We get up right, at, right in the face of the child and say, listen, you're welcome to be here as long as you want, but that kind of conversation is not going to be heard here. It's unacceptable. Are you with me? You know, so this is our house. You know, so you have dominion, take it. Are you with me? You know? Not long ago, I heard about the same kind of situation, you know, and, and you have to deal with it. Why? If you ex accept it, if you invite, if you do nothing, then what you're doing is you're, you're condoning it, and you just cannot do that. Are you listening to me? Now, he might go home and lie to his parents about something you said or did. I mean, that's conceivable. But, you know, in, uh, as tastefully and appropriately as you uh, can, you just got to say, we're not doing that. We don't do that in this house. We don't talk like that. Are you with me? Okay. And um, so talking about exercising, one of the things that happens using that example is people don't stand up. They fail to stand. Okay. Go back to that scripture there in Ephesians uh, chapter uh, 6. Look again what it is that the apostle says here. Did I tell you to turn James? Yeah, let's, let's do that first. All right, sorry. James chapter four, verse seven. Submit yourselves therefore to God. What's the next three words? Do what? Resist the devil. Say, no. Okay? Now look at Ephesians. Uh, now go to Ephesians and look at this verse with me. In chapter 6, in verse 10, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Now listen to this, that you may be able to what? Stand. Stand. Stand against the wiles of the devil. So there's some standing that has to be done. And a lot of times when we stand, we have to do it in faith. Now, I'll help you understand what I mean by that. I have come to know what the Bible has to say. And I happen to believe what it is that God has said. So when I stand in faith, what I'm doing is, is I am saying, this is how we live. This is how we talk. This is how we behave, we act, we, we whatever. And when I stand that way, then I may have pushback. I may have somebody come against me. I may have, or I may not see immediate results, okay? But it doesn't change where I am going to stand. So when he says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, what he's saying is, is once you decide and you have a resolve and you have a conviction in your heart, don't you ever move because off of what it is that God has said. You just stay there. Be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against 
the wiles of the devil. Because sometimes there is a duration between what it is that you believe and love and want to, you know, have or experience within your life and its manifestation. And you say, no, I'm not settling. I'm not moving, and I'm going to have God's best in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And when you start believing and acting and talking like that, things start to move in the direction that you intended them to go. But you have to stand. And so a lot of times, again, you know, if you don't see immediate response, you don't move. You say, no, no, no. No, this is no. Uh -uh. We are not having this. You know, then there's this battle going on, you know. And thank God you just stand your ground. Everybody say, I can do that. You can do that. Glory to God. Now, notice this. Um, turn over to uh, 1 Peter chapter 5. Here's another verse of Scripture. <clears throat> uh, verse 8. <clears throat> Be sober. Does anybody's translation or Bible say something else than that? Uh, be sober, be vigilant. Well, it doesn't matter. Be sober. Be vigilant. You know, people, you know a lot of times when you live for God, people, they, they think you're prudish. You know, because you don't run to the same excess that they do. Are you with me? Say, no, that's no way for us to live. You know, that's no way for us to speak. That's no way for us to act. You know, whatever the case might be. But be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Didn't say he could. He's looking. Huh? And so what you're just saying in your life, you can look all you want, but ain't nothing happening here. Now, notice the next verse that says, whom resist, resist him in the steadfast in the faith some of you you know you're believing god for your kids you know maybe they went south sideways however you define it and you're not happy with the outcome or whatever don't move i said don't move i'm telling you what you are their greatest asset and just continue to believe god praise god stand in the gap and don't move whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same things, same kind of things, tests and trials, afflictions, you know, go on in your brethren that are in the world. You're not the only one. See, that's the devil. He says, well, you know, nobody's got it as bad as I do. Well, chances are somebody's got it a lot worse than you do. But he doesn't tell you that. He just tells you that, you know, it's the pity thing. You know, man, that, I, I mean, you're talking about the, the wiles of the devil. If I can corkscrew you into the ground with self-pity, I will do it in a heartbeat. But that's why you don't let condemnation, you don't let these things that are untrue about who you are in Christ, you know, invade your life. Get off of me in Jesus' name. Because they don't belong in your life. Hallelujah. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And he knows that. I'm telling you what, the devil don't like happy Christians, you know? But there ain't nothing he can do about that either. So, we got to learn to stand. Now, I'll close with one final scripture that, that, does that make sense to you? You know, if you got a place that you're believing God where your, your family is concerned, where you have a home that's filled with love and different things, and there's all kinds of chaos or problems or whatever going on, man, don't you, don't you move. You believe God. And then to the extent of your authority in that situation, you exercise it. Amen? Moms and dads, get on the same page and attack this thing. Are you with me? So important. Man, I'm telling you what, one can put 1,000 to flight, two can put 10,000 to flight. But can two walk together except they agree? No. You know, so there has, that, that, that just makes everything so powerful. Amen. All right. So here's another verse of Scripture. Um, the Bible says, hallelujah. All right, it's coming. Um. Whosoever, how many whosoever's we have here? Shall say to this mountain, be thou removed, be cast into the sea. 
shall not doubt in their heart, but shall believe that those things which they say will come to pass, they'll have whatever they say. I didn't say that, he did. Jesus said that, right? Therefore, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Believe what? That you receive them and you will have them, right? So there's this, this time frame between when we believe we receive and when the manifestation comes, right? And it's in that moment or time that you have to stand. Isn't that right? You know, therefore, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them. Father, I believe that I receive them. People say, well, you don't have it. And you could just say, I didn't say that. I said, I believe I receive it. Hallelujah. Amen. And believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now, here's an interesting uh, little tag on. Next verse. Uh, next verse. And when you, what's that next word? Stand. When you stand. And when you stand, pray. So I'm standing for God's best. I'm standing for the will of God in my life. I'm standing on whatever it is that he has promised or he has said. Well, in this case, it says, as you stand. And, and obviously, the, the context here is, is that you have to forgive. huh? But I, I wanted you to notice, and when you what? Stand praying. I'm standing. Hallelujah. I'm standing for better in my life. I'm standing for better in my kids' life. I'm standing for the will of God in all of our lives. I'm standing in the plan and the purpose of God, and hell can't do anything about it. Hallelujah. So when you stand praying, huh, that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, I ain't moving. I believe the word of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. You're going to bring it to pass just like you promised. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Amen. Now, you got to be on solid ground. I mean, you got to know and have the promise, you know, whatever it is, whatever reference, you know, that you use as far as, like, for example, you know, he said, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's a good verse. Hallelujah, especially when you got needs. Amen. Any of you got any needs? Sure. Well, thank God you can stand on the word and believe that what he promised, he will perform. And then we just have to do what it is that he said. Now, you can't get outside the will of God in these matters because if you do that, then you're not on solid ground. Right? We don't have, you know, um, I'll, I'll give you an example. We talked about, you know, sometimes when we're praying for loved ones, and we want to come back into the sheepfold, or maybe they haven't been saved, or whatever the case might be. We don't have authority over human will. You can't make anybody do anything. But you sure enough can pray for them that God will work in that situation to bring them into a place to where they will come to themselves or uh, find a place of repentance, however you want to describe it, where they recognize the error of their way and repent and come back to God. Amen. You can stand in the gap for that. Are you listening to you? But you can't force them to do anything. Huh? We've already, <laughs> we've already tried that. Now, if they're your little beaters, you know, and they're, they're in your house, then you can enforce. Huh? But, I mean, you know, when they, when they get to an age of accountability and things of that nature, it's on them. So you can't, you can't go beyond the word. We don't have time to get into that. I would love to, but, you know, that happens. People want to try to, well, never mind. That's enough. Having done all to stand, stand, therefore. Amen. Having your loins girt about with truth and the breastplate of righteousness and, and the, you know, sword of the Spirit. You know, the word of God, the shield of faith, wherewith you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of who? The wicked one. Yeah. Huh? You know, praying always with all prayer and manner of supplication. So we got the things we need. Can you say amen? You got them. So you can just go to work on some of this stuff, praise God, and say, Father, I'm so glad you let me know. 
so that I can walk in the light of the Word of God and be blessed. Stay full of joy. Hallelujah. Do more praising God. Sing more. You say, I don't sing very well. Nobody else has to hear it. Amen. You know, just rejoice and celebrate. Praise God. And, and you know, the thing about it is, I don't think people get this, but sometimes, man, you just got to stay in these places until you get victory. And a note of victory comes. Are you with me? Sometimes when you're in, in, in a, a perilous kind of situation, dude, you just got to stay there until you get the victory. Yeah. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? I've had to do it many times and not so, you know, not so far in the past, you know, because the devil is out to kill, steal, and to destroy. But Jesus came so that you could have life and have it more abundantly. And he wants you to stay free. Hallelujah. No, no, you know, no weight, you know. What did he say? Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll make your life worse. No, he said, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I'm meek and lowly of heart. You'll find rest into your soul, for my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So if, you're, if, if your burden right now is not light, then these are some things that you can do. Hallelujah. Well, if I could just get brother so-and-so to pray for me, or if I could get sister, you know, and they could intercede and this and that and the other. Well, thank God for intercession. Thank God for brother and sister. But the reality is some of these things, we just need to take the tools that God has given to us and begin to use them and just stay there. Glory to God. I'll tell you what, praise God. You'll get breakthrough. Hallelujah, you can stay full of joy. Sometimes you got to just say, you know what, I, this is it. I'm going to drive a stake in the ground, and I'll tell you what, we're not, we're not leaving until we get victory. Are you with me? And sometimes, you know, you come away from it, you got victory, but you don't know how the victory is going to come about. But you really don't care because you're happy. Huh? You're just going to watch God do what only he can do for whatever it is that you're doing. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Y'all stand up. you good listeners, and I'll go too long. Probably already have. Hallelujah. It's supposed to be an hour of power, and we're, we're, we're past that. Hallelujah. Father, we want to commit these things to our hearts, that which you've spoken to us through your word. And Father, I want to thank you for each and every person within the sound of my voice and those watching online that God, they'll take their place where their lives are concerned in the name of Jesus, hallelujah, stand their ground, rejoice, and make sure, Father, that their eyes are stayed on you because they trust in you, Father. There's truth that's been revealed to them tonight that, again, maybe they knew, but it's been, it's been made fresh to each and every one of their minds and their consciousness and their hearts. And so, Father God, I thank you for strengthening each and every person with might by your spirit in our inner man. Thank you, Lord God. Hallelujah. That the just live by faith. And that's a faith that we can count on. And Father, we thank you for your blessing in every life, every person, and every heart. Hallelujah. Let's just lift one hand up toward heaven for a moment. Glory to God. Thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Father God, for manifesting your plan and purpose, your will, Father God, within each and every. I thank you, Lord God, for encouragement. I come against discouragement. Yes, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I take authority over you now. We break your power in the lives of these that are present in Jesus' name. And Father God, I thank you for the joy of the Lord to return unto them. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your power in their life. Yes, Father God, no longer burdened, no longer worried, no longer filled with care, no longer thinking that somehow or another they have to do it in their own strength or in their own might. No, we're going to be strong in you, Father, and in the power of your might. And so we thank you for victory tonight. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Praise God. You may be seated. We're going to receive our evening offering.